My guest today is Dr. Michael Heberling. Dr. Heberling has been the president of the Baker College Center for Graduate Studies in Flint, Michigan since 1988. Mike holds a B.S. degree from Cornell University, an M.S. degree from the University of Northern Colorado, and a Ph.D. in Production and Operations Management from Michigan State University. Mike is a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel with 21 years of active duty service. He had 1,500 hours flying time in the B-52. Prior to coming to Baker College, Mike was a senior policy and business analyst with the Antion Corporation. Mike is on the Board of Scholars of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, and he has written extensively for the Foundation for Economic Education. Mike, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Mike. I really appreciate you inviting me on. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure, Mike. As, I, as I've been telling you through some of our emails, I've read most of about, I think it's about 12 articles you've written now for the Freeman. That's correct. And what I wanted to do, Mike, is there, obviously we can't go through all 12 of them, which would be nice, but there are a couple I'd like to take a, a, a kind of a deep dive into. The, the first one here, Mike, is, is you wrote uh, an article that I think is really illuminating, uh, pun intended, um, called Dim Bulbs. You wrote this one, I think this, let's see, this was July, August of this year. Right, that's correct. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on how I even came up writing this. Uh, I've been writing about uh, government mandating uh, products that happen to work just fine. Their old, old ones work just fine. And I noticed that there were a lot of trends in all these I, I'd written about and, uh, over the 12. Like, it's kind of nice I'm going to kind of summarize those, but I'd written about uh, the government washing machine, the government air conditioner, government gas, and even the government toilet. And there's a common themes that seem to go through all of these, and I kind of want to, uh, I brought these out in the article to share this with your audience. The first one is, I call this phase one, is when the uh, government bureaucrats, consumer advocates, environmentalists trumpet how wonderful this new product is. If you boil down all the hoopla that surrounds this, it really comes down to two attributes that they really are uh, highlighting. The first one is it's the big savings for the consumer. And the second one, that it's good for the environment. And this is usually someone very high up in the government will usually promote this. And, for example, was the Secretary of the Energy, former one uh, in the Bush administration, Samuel Bodman, who had said that we need to do this because it's a simple tasks that we can take to save money and help the environment. This is a typical approach that the government always tends to use in this and pushing is the, the two themes. They never say that their chosen product is a better quality. The emphasis is always about savings and being good for the environment. So when the government, uh, uh, environments, consumer advocates talk about big savings, they're really never talking about the upfront cost. What they mean, they're talking about the operating cost of the product. For example, the light bulbs, these uh, CFL light bulbs that they're promoting, I went and got a, I compared them at my local Kroger store. The old one, uh, the Thomas Edison incandescent one, cost 22 cents. And the government one cost uh, 5.49. So in other words, it's 25 times more expensive. So obviously that's... Uh, being that way is uh, uh, is more expensive. So that's part one. And do uh, you have any comments on that, uh, Mike? Yeah, I do. So what I hear you saying, Mike, and as I read through the article, I think you have actually four phases here, but, but you're saying these phases are easily recognizable. R right, correct. So the first one is, is the high, high pro uh, promotion. And then the, the other one I said is it's the, the, the cost for the consumers is a great savings, but it's always on the not on the upfront cost, which most consumers would be probably rate higher. The second one is is I view this this environmentalism piece. And in the past, uh, you, our government used to promote uh, patriotism as something to get its citizens to do something. Whereas I, it's strange now, but I view it's environmentalism which is is happening now. 
And this is, I, I view this as becoming our de facto state religion. Extravagant claims about the environment uh, are, are to be taken as gospel. When the government says that we need to do something because it's good for the environment, we're expected to take this on faith as, faith as being true. We're not to question the government's motives, logic, mental state for taking away our freedom of choice. Here's what I find interesting. We're expected to feel good about foregoing our selfish consumer desires because there is no higher calling in this country than saving the environment. Okay, phase two is that the consumers uh, weigh the advantage and disadvantage of this wonderful product, and they decide the new product is really not as one, all that wonderful after all. I think the reason is is that the most consumers feel that uh, what's being advocated, fewer choices and higher prices, is not something they, they want to go after. I have experienced this in my own house, where I actually bought one of these bulbs, and I found out it takes about three minutes for the thing to come on. And I made uh, jokingly called this the uh, roach two-minute warning. gives it uh, time to uh, take shelter. Um, so in other words, one of the things I, I'm trying to highlight here is that it may be cheaper, so as a result, there's a tendency for consumers to use it more. So this light was very annoying turning it on and off, so I tended to leave it on as one of the few lights uh, in the whole house that I will leave on. And because it's so cheap, and that's kind of what happened with this cafe fuel standards, the government promoted it, wanted people to do that, and then they have it driving more and use more gas as a result. Okay, the third phase is uh, he didn't have their recommendations ignored. The elitist class didn't make steps to mandate the product. And so that's what happened in this case, which is odd. The, the light bulb, which works perfectly fine right now, has been uh, outlawed, and it's going to be phased out in 2012. Okay, phase four is it then becomes clear that the consumer's reluctance was uh, justified. The product is, in fact, bad. But it doesn't really matter because the old product that worked just fine was outlawed. So another thing here is we talk about how this is supposed to be good for the environment. Well, it turns out these light bulbs, that's not the case at all. These light bulbs contain 5 to 10 milligrams of mercury per bulb, and that's one of the most toxic elements on Earth, and it causes serious health problems, including nerve and kidney damage. And the new government mandate will result in millions or even billions of these bulbs being put in landfills, which will leach out and contaminate the soil or groundwater. One of the really ironic things about this law that passed was that there was a, a piece in it that required that it promoted the 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 government was it spent forty million forty million dollars has been set aside to promote this product. The irony is that they're promoting that we have choices, but in fact, the government has actually taken away the choice. So, um, well, so let me ask you this, Mike, because I think this four-phase model you have here is really enlightening for my listeners. If we if we use the CFL bulb, and let's say I think that's compact fluorescent light. Fluorescent lights, correct. Okay, so using that as an example here. We've obviously gone through the first phase where the advocates are trumpeting big savings and environmental friendliness. Then we've had the phase two where the consumers reject the product for, you're saying, basically the price is very high. Well, the, 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 the point is that, that basically works. consumers uh, you know, have a lot of reasons that they buy products. And it's very, I think it's elitist attitude to think that the main reason that these customers want that is because it's going to be save them money in the long run. I find interesting, Ed Fulner, who's a president of Heritage Foundation, he said this. It's uh, made this interesting observation about government mandates. It's only inferior or unnecessary products that require congressional intervention to survive. Useful or innovative products thrive on their own. And so I'm really not opposed to this, this product as it is. What I'm opposed to is the government saying we can no longer have the Thomas Edison light bulb. For some, in some cases, one might be better, in another case, the other. But we don't have that choice anymore. As of 2012, they're going to phase out and be illegal to both produce and sell the Edison light bulb. That is a great point. Um, so let me think about this a second. So actually, then, Mike, so we not only passed through phase two where we're rejecting this thing, but phase three where the mandates are in place, we're all ready to phase three on this thing. 
Uh, that's correct. And uh, this was uh, implemented by, you know, this was signed into law as a result of this, uh, what we call the um, Energy Security Act. It was passed uh, several years ago, but it doesn't kick in until uh, 2012. So they're still outlawing each of the various uh, wattage of the bulbs. So it's... Uh, I think it's very disturbing, and I think that maybe as we get closer to a lot of consumers, there may be some pushback as a result of this. Okay. So, we're, actually, we're coming up on a break here, Mike. So, what just kind of sum up the, the light bulb fiasco here. So, we're, we'll be moving into phase four, where we just simply won't be able to get the, the Edison light bulb anymore. Well, what I find interesting is Europe has already done this. They're ahead of this. Ahead of us, they've uh, implemented the same uh, mandate, and it's uh, interesting. The uh, Europeans are already starting to stash all these, uh, some of the old ones that will be illegal to save them. And so I, I feel as though we have a couple options. One is we can do that. We can do that. We can start stashing these. The other one is we can. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a humorous thing in the article talking about. We all need to buy some hazmat suits because of the mercury content of these. Oh my gosh. And, uh, and the third one is there actually is some legislation proposed by uh, uh, Michelle Bachman who's saying uh, she's, she's trying to get a law that's called the, the Light Bulb Freedom of Choice Act, but it's uh, facing extensive opposition from uh, the Green Lobby, big government, and actually consumer advocate groups. And I, I kind of summed up that fighting for freedom in this country uh, is an uphill battle. Yeah, so on that note, we'll take a break there and pick it up there. Uh, you're listening to Free Markets. I'm Mike Beitler, your host. I'm today with Dr. Mike Heberling. We were talking before the break about his article in the Freeman called Dim Bulbs. And um, I guess to kind of sum that up, Mike, we were, we were saying basically this is a bulb that costs 25 times what the 75-watt Edison bulb costs. And I think I read here in your article, Mike, that basically if you want to get long-term savings, you basically don't turn it off. Is, is that right? Well, that's that's the irony of the thing is that uh, you're supposed to leave it on. The, the number of times you turn it on and off reduces the, the lifespan of, of the bulb, which kind of defeats the whole purpose. And someone wrote that the irony is that here it's a energy-saving device that you're supposed to leave on, which seems contradictory. So. Wow. I think you also said, as far as the quality of the product, uh, it, it, it's not good for reading, which would seem to be, you know, one of the reasons you would turn the bulb on. And then it also loses a lot of its uh, illumination. What was it about half the way through the life of this thing? It, it gets dim. Well, that's the thing. I think this was uh, rushed through uh, far earlier than it should have been, and obviously it shouldn't have been mandated. But some of these these uh, you know, kind of sad traits on the, that are coming out, like the the illumination part, is really not the quality. of The light is not as good. People a lot of people don't once they've got the two, they like the old uh, Edison incandescent much better. And the other thing is that. It, Sure, it might last all this long, but no one is ever saying that the quality of the light is going to stay good that entire amount of time. So basically what I'm saying here is that those people that want those light bulbs should be able to purchase those, and those that don't should be able to purchase the ones that we currently have. And that's the reason I don't really think the government needs to tell us what kind of light bulb a consumer should have to buy. Well, and I think, Mike, the point you made before the break was an excellent one. You're saying, you know, we should be perfectly okay as free market free market advocates to say, you know, you can buy any kind of bulb you want, but as long as it's not being mandated. And that takes me, I guess, to my next question. You had an article called Green Power where you were talking about this whole issue of mandating these government products. And I guess I'd be talking about government products and quotes because they don't actually make